I am Bill Cortright with Living Right with Bill Cortright. And this is the Stress Mastery Podcast, where we take you from the science to the spirituality of stress mastery. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Stress Mastery Podcast. I am your host, Bill Cortright. This week, our topic is resilience. And today's Setup Sunday, we're going to be talking about how do you become an expansion teacher in working with today's students? And we have a special guest to talk about this. We have Chelsea Courtright. She is a third grade teacher in Miami-Dade public school system um, and in Miami, Florida. And she is happens to be my favorite. My, my, no, I can't say that. <laughs> my favorite daughter, right? Alex, she's not my favorite daughter. She's my second. No, can't say that because... <laughs> You know, we don't want this rivalry going on. We don't want magnetic desire in our family. Okay. She's my daughter, Chelsea. I'm very proud of her. You guys have heard me talk about her and what she's doing in the classroom. And I wanted to bring it because our topic this week is resilience. If we look at resilience, Chelsea, and welcome to the show. Hi. Resilience <laughs> is the process and the outcome of successfully adapting to difficult or challenging life experiences. Would you say that today's teacher is pretty resilient? I would say that that's uh, an understatement. <laughs> uh, definitely an understatement, right? And so what I want to do is I want to talk a little bit today about kind of the, the classroom and our students that's going on in the world. And of course, you're giving your viewpoint and you are in Miami public schools, which are not easy, but it's kind of like a, uh, I would say a national problem. And I want to kind of address it, right? We just want to address your experiences from the classroom. So Chelsea, you teach third grade, correct? Yes. Um, I teach third grade in an um, underprivileged area. Um, my class is specialized um, where I have the third grade retainees. A retainee is a student who has been held back um, because of my class and because most of the time the students that are held back are struggling readers and they have been for quite some time. I have what's called double retainees. So a lot of my students are maybe held, they're held back in third grade, but they're also held back in other, in previous grades. So they're sitting in a third grade classroom, but they're really supposed to be in fifth grade. Um, so that opens up a lot of challenges. Um, not, it's not only academically, it's more mentally. And we know that, you know, there's a lot of growth going on during those ages. Um, and it is, it is quite a struggle. Lots of resilience yeah. happening over there. <laughs> and, and so one of the things that you've got known for in your classroom is being able to get to these kids and get and get high scores of grades, right? Their, their test scores are very good when you're done with them after a year. And I know that's giving you a lot of opportunities to grow and everything else and that, but I want to talk about how you do that because these are kids that and now I'm not putting any teachers down, but would you say that a lot of times the teachers have given up on these kids or? I don't think it's so much that the teachers give up on them. I think that it's a lot more work. This particular population is a lot more work than if I were teaching a classroom, a general ed classroom that had students that were reading on grade level. If I was in a area where students are able to, parents are able to provide tutors and parents are able to sit at home with them and have dinners and talk to them i think that that's where the challenges really occur and so that's why we want to that's why i brought you on because i want to talk about what does it take to become an expansion teacher which when we talk about expansion and stress mastery these are green zone high teachers not in restriction not in fear not in the red zone but if you can become an expansion teacher, create an expansion classroom with this set of students, would you agree with me? Anybody can do it? Definitely. Yeah, so I, I like that. That's a great, that's that's an answer. That's what I want to talk about today. So 
we talk on stress mastery and, and a lot of your kids are going to have this. And I think this is something we need to discuss because of the pandemic, because of when schools got shut down, because of the things parents are going through, more kids are being raised in toxic, stressful environments. And this just means that they're in a toxic stress environment where there's no escape from the stress. It's just constant stress, constant fear, constant, there, there's no buffers at home. Would you agree with me on that? Definitely. I think that a lot of my students are not having their most basic needs met. So how can I, as a teacher, expect them to focus on learning their multiplication facts when they are trying to survive at home? That is where a lot of the problem really, really begins. And we're not just talking about underprivileged kids either. We're talking about toxic stress where sometimes it could be an overcompetitive environment or it could be just an environment where the parents are so busy and distracted. I'm not putting parents down because this is unprecedented stress in our society where they just can't give the kid the time they need. They're trying to have the family in survival. Would you agree with that? Yes, definitely. I think it goes both ways. Um, you have parents that are in a, a more privileged area having to work nonstop to keep up with that with you know the that socioeconomic status and then you have on the other end of the spectrum parents that are having to work just to put food on the table it definitely goes both ways and it creates the same syndrome it basically means this people toxic stress syndrome happens when a child brain does not develop with the ability to switch off the limbic red zone into the cortex green zone. They just get stuck in stress. And the way a child develops to make that brain go back and forth, they need what are called buffers. So they can have stress, but they need buffers where they can shut down and, and relax and things like that. They need those type of buffers. Now, why is this important? When you're stuck in the red zone brain, you're in reaction. You only make good decisions out of the green zone brain. That's when you control your behavior. So Chelsea, when your class begins, you already are working with a little bit of a challenge and you kind of choose this challenge in your classroom. Weren't you teaching um, gifted <laughs> in your career? I was, I do love. Um... <laughs> You are a court right, man. You just let, uh, let put it in front of me and see what I can do, you know? So in the beginning of the year, let's talk about what it's like when you first start teaching your class. What's it like? Because you were sharing with me the age differences. You can have one little girl at eight, another one at 12, and then you have challenges there. Can you touch on yes. that? So because um, schools are so understaffed and because we are just filled to the brim with students, regardless of what, you know, pol politicians may say, it's a, uh, I'm living it. Um, my classroom is supposed to be a specialized classroom that is entirely made for these retained students, but that's not the case. We can't have one teacher sitting with 14 students while the others have 30 in their class. So I do have some students that have not been retained, and the dynamic between my eight-year-olds and my 10, almost 11-year-olds, that is a, a huge challenge for me, as That's it is for them, because, <laughs> you know, um, that is a big age difference. And, you know, maturity-wise, and their bodies are changing, and it's it's a lot, it's, it's, a, it's a challenge in itself. So we're kind of setting the stage for, and then we're going to go to some of the techniques that you're using in your classroom. And we did a show and actually I, I know you listened to it because you were featured on it. Uh, we were talking about the Pygmalion effect on your expectations of how you work with your children. Can you share with them how you look at their test grades and how you explain that? I got to score them, but there's other ways of looking at them. Yes. Yeah, so um, my students are struggling readers um, and most of the time it's it's very difficult that it's very difficult for you know the the school system to ask these students who have been struggling readers their entire life to all of a sudden in one year be on grade level and be what's called proficient 
Um, so in my classroom, my students know that regardless of where they may academically be working, we celebrate growth. Even if it means going from a, a, a score of a 45 to a 58, which they're both still Fs, but did we see some growth? Yes. Are we happy with our growth? Yes. Um, do we take, do we try our best? Did we take pride in our work? Yes. That's all I can ask for. So that is, um, that is how, you know, we grade and I have to grade. It, it's very unfortunate. I do have to grade on grade level. So my kids are never going to, it, it's not that they're never going to, you know, but it's very difficult for them to be an honor roll and, you know, to be a part of those celebrations. So we're constantly trying to celebrate the little growth within our, within my classroom, within our classroom. And so you teach your classroom a little different. I, I know we had, I, I had heard you talk that once you close those doors, it's yours. Can you <laughs> a little touch on that? Because these are like your kids, right? That's the way you look at them. Can you, because I think it's important because people don't realize what our teachers really do. And also you told me like in your school, where people think teachers don't do anything for some reason, you said they're all rock stars. Can you touch on that a little bit? How, how the teachers in that school work and about how you do your classroom? Yes. So um, you oftentimes underprivileged schools, schools that are nearing um, D's and F's, it's you're they don't celebrate us in the community. Um, we're not going to produce, um, you know, we're not going to get perfect test scores. We're not going to get an, an A grade. Um, but that doesn't mean that the teachers don't work their butts off. Um, and I have noticed because I have worked in, not as a teacher, but I have worked in A schools. And the teachers that at my school, the amount of effort that they put in to just meet these basic needs of these students and to just push for growth and push to become better individuals is outstanding. If, if my coworkers went to A schools where they were given the, the, amount, the supplies that they need, if they were not sitting in classrooms um, over capacity, you know, they would be absolute rock stars. And I, I really, really do believe that. And I, I think it's easy to kind of, you know, say that these teachers that are working in these types of schools, you know, oh, they're doing, they're working there because they don't have to do anything because, you know, the expectations for these kids are, are so low and that couldn't be so far from the truth. You don't choose these type of schools if you are not a hard worker, you don't. And so we're talking about our children, right? And it's so easy to look at the top 10% children, but if we look at society, the top 10%, there's 90% living in society, right? And these are what you're working with. You're working with children. And children are, especially in that particular stage of development that you have them, is that second stage of development from age seven to 16. This is the experiences that's going to form the identity that's going to set their behavior as adults. So tell them a little bit of how you use your classroom as a buffer for them to get out of stress and to grow and some maybe even throw some of the stress mastery stuff because for you don't know that Chelsea is a stage four development. So you guys know that she's been coaching for a few years now. And so she is one of those people that have shift her whole life. And she's taken that shift into the classroom. Can you talk about that a little bit, Chelsea? Um, so it's kind of like what we talked about the other day with the Pygmalion effect. Um, my students know that I have extremely high expectations for who they are as individuals for their growth, for conflict resolution. Um, and they know that the second that they step inside my classroom, that there are rules and regulations and we are going to be the best possible versions of ourselves as possible. Um, we do uh, we do, do the, the, the green, my version of the green focus power hour. And um, as we spoke about before, it's very difficult. My, my students are, are struggling readers and that would include writing. So um, 
for a, a, a little bit, I tried to get the writing aspect of it. And I realized that they, that wasn't for them. It wasn't making, it wasn't doing its purpose. So, um, we, I allow them to draw for the 10 minutes. I allow them to read for the 10 minutes and reading is another thing. Um, I was giving them, I was providing them books that I thought was on their level that they would independently be able to read. And I realized, what am I doing? You know, that's taking the joy of reading away. That's taking this, you know, this breath of fresh air that they get when they read away by choosing and make not allowing them to to find the joy in the green focus power hour. So I, I had to adapt there. I'm definitely not a perfect teacher. Um, just recently, we started eating lunch in the classroom because um, as you were saying, my, my classroom is a buffer. So the biggest problems that I have is outside of the classroom. Their identities are still not set. So the second that they step out or the second that they're in someone else's classroom, there always seems to be conflict. Um, it, it's easy for a teacher to be disappointed and think, you know, man, what is happening? Are, are they not really, are they not really learning? Are they not really, you know, using the conflict resolution skills that we go over in class? And, um, I, you know, it's, it, they're, so I have them come upstairs for lunch with me. I give up my lunch. <laughs> and, um, just recently I started putting up a conversation on like discussions for kids and they're just little questions. If you had a hundred dollars, what would you spend it on? If you could travel anywhere, where would you go? And um, I do kind of like uh, like lunch dates where every five minutes they switch the person that they are asking these questions to. And it's kind of built a, a lot more unity, kind of a lot, it did a lot more unity amongst the students. That's beautiful. You had you, had, you know, so we talk about resilience, right? It's the process and outcome of successfully adapting to difficult or challenging situations, life experiences, right? So you have a challenging classroom and you have adapted to it. Can you talk to them and tell them a, a little story about your own personal growth? How, remember you told me a story once where you were instructing the kids to be quiet and you turned around and you realized they weren't being quiet and then you all suddenly slowed down and paused and realized that they were talking about the, the yes. yeah. can you share that story okay, so. and how your personal development has helped these kids please so my students know that um when I feel overwhelmed, I don't like a lot of noise. I think that probably goes for most people. Um, when I'm feeling anxious, which oftentimes teachers are because the expectations and the pressure on us is outrageous. Um, so I had them work in pairs, which um, collaborating together is great you know, for these type of students, um, but it does require noise. So I, was starting to get kind of annoyed and I was getting frustrated and I was uh, about to tell them, you know, we gotta be, why can't you guys be quiet? Why are we talking so loud? And then I stopped and I listened and I realized they're talking about what they're supposed to be talking about. They are really getting deep into it. They're using higher order thinking and they're, they're really, really learning together. And so um, that was, something that I had to stop and realize and you, you know, saw your I, ego yeah oh absolutely absolutely <laughs> the same thing with the writing and the green focus power hour you know why wouldn't why did I need them to write if that wasn't the best outlet for them why was I pushing it so hard and I had to stop and think you know you you got to adapt to to what works best for them uh, those are my children and you know, I, I've never met a teacher that really refers to her students as her students. We call them our children. And yeah. so um, it does hurt my heart when, um, you know, teachers are, are looked down on for different situations because the amount of resilience that teachers have, um, the different personalities that we have in our classroom, the challenges that we face from every single angle you know, we don't give up on our children. And, I, you know, I <laughs> think that that's really important to, to say. I think that it's pretty amazing because I know your story, obviously, you always loved working with kids, even when you were little, I know. 
but then you kind of didn't want to become a teacher because they just don't pay anything, right? So you kind of fought it for a while, and then you realize that's what I'm supposed to do. So what is it that, why, what would you say if you could talk to uh, our president right now and say, this is what the schools need, and it would change the entire country? What would you tell them as a teacher that's on the front lines? Oh, that's a loaded question. Yes, it um, is. We need to, I, then this is my opinion. I think yes, that I, I'm asking your opinion. <laughs> I think we put too much emphasis on academics and not enough on creating real, stable, thoughtful, compassionate individuals. I think that's what we need. I think that we need to build these students first and then the academics will follow after. Oh, wow. Because we talk about how when we're seeing people through the ego, we see them as objects instead of people. And so I, it feels like when you're in school, they see you as an object. You're a test score. You're smart. You're dumb. You're you're fast. You're slow. You're good. You're bad. They, they don't see you as, you know, your true self that maybe you're an artist or maybe you're having a problem or do, is that what you're, you're saying? Definitely. I think, um, it, I do think it's more important to be a good person than a smart person. That's so, and so you teach that, and I know you've had great success in your classroom because of it too. And you, you were telling me about a, a student that wanted to hit somebody, and he just cut, he just the way he was, but instead he went and told you, yes. and he actually let go. Can you, can you share that? Story? Yes. I think it's a um, I, um, a lot of my students, um, when there's any type of conflict, immediately it's the it's the fight or flight response, and most of the time it's the fight. Um, and unfortunately, that does um, oftentimes, I believe, come from from home. Um, there's many students that have told me before. My mom says that if somebody hits me, I need to hit them back hard enough that they're never going to want to hit me again. And that is very hard to to uh, to unteach that you know we're constantly we're being pushed in every single direction we have so much pressure and we're trying to untangle some of these things that are being taught at home that are that don't work in society so um i i had a student who does have does have these challenges um and another student had said something inappropriate to him and he came up to me and he said and there was tears in his eyes because you could tell how frustrated he was and how he wanted to fight and he really took everything in his power to come up to me and he said miss courtright um i um miss courtright i need to I, I need help right now i need help because if i i'm gonna fight him i don't want to fight him and i need help right now and, um, you know, I took him outside and we talked and we slowed down and um, I allowed him to, you know, take a brain break. And he went into another classroom with a his previous teacher who he felt comfortable with and who allowed him to enter her classroom, um, even being at this heightened stage. And this is what I mean when teachers, you know, we love our children. Mm -hmm. um, and he was able to he was able to to use conflict resolution, which was so beautiful to see, um, especially in the environment that I work in. I, I was really that was it. He doesn't need to get A's on everything. But that was a moment that I thought, wow, wow, Chelsea, you're doing it. You're doing something. <laughs> I think if they listen to you and the things you're saying and they talk to the teachers that are really working on the you know they're they're the frontline troops right i think we could change a lot of things but we have to change the way we do school you got to get away from memorization and grades and that's how you're grading that child not that they don't need to learn things everybody needs to learn things but like you said what's more important knowing the history of you know world war ii or whatever or being able to get out of a conflict resolution and and really dealing with another person and being able to to be in awareness and What's communicate your needs communicate that you feel this way miss Courtney. i feel like i'm going to lose control i need to take these steps in order to come back down that is more important than knowing your multiplication facts and i stand by it 
I agree. I, I totally agree with you. And you, the job you've done. So let me ask you a question. This is going to be loaded. Are you ready? Oh, goodness. <laughs> are you thinking of leaving the classroom? Oh, boy. You know your, your co-workers are going to do So I... I am somebody who constantly needs to be evolving in some way or another. Um, I don't know if right now I am going to be able to do more being out of the classroom. I think with how understaffed we are, with how the education system has taken such a hit, I think I'm probably exactly where I need to be. <laughs> um, it's hard to say that with everything that's going on, but um, you know, that's the that's the reality of it. You know, resilience is not giving up, and I'm not going to give up on my babies. Those are my children. Well, I know you got opportunities to go to private schools, you got opportunities to go in and you stay on the front lines because I know my daughter, she needs to be challenged. And we talk about how you grow through challenge, right? So you got some great scores, Lad. You surprised a lot of people with your end of the year scores. Can you talk oh, about yeah. that a little bit? Um, that. I think that it was a combination of building that endurance and that resilience within my students. Um, and they just thrived. They took it. It was a put. It, it took a lot of work. It took a lot more work than yeah. I think people really truly understand um, unless you are in that in the classroom um, and I really focused on building them up as individuals and they they took off from there I, it wasn't just me it was it was a common they believed in themselves as much as I believed in them you know, so that, that's, that must be very rewarding for you as a teacher after all that work to prove everybody of, wrong. So one of my girls got a perfect score on the state math test. And there was, I think, two perfect scores in our entire school. That's unheard of. And one of them was my girl from yeah. my classroom, a retained student. A retained yeah. student. And that's why I want people to understand. We always talk about we have a either a fixed mindset or a growth mindset. If you have a fixed mindset that, well, that child's bad or that child can't do that, what's going to happen is that Pygmalion effect, that expectation, they're going to meet that expectation. When they're in third grade, you can do anything, but you've got to be diligent with them. And unfortunately, this needs to get home, you know, because you can only do so much as a teacher. And I know that's frustrating for you. Oh, it is. Because if I could, you know, take my kids home with me and make sure that they are well nourished and that they do their homework and they go to bed on time and they read independently and they play outside and they could do all these things that, you know, kids need in order for growth, I would, but that's not possible. So, um, it, you know, that that's a challenge within itself. So I'm going to close it out here. You have an opportunity to work downtown. So now they're looking to bring you into the executive wing of it all. Is that something? Because you wouldn't have your hands on the kids anymore, but you could maybe change policies. Is that I, I, I'm not I'm calling you out on public. You know, we only get like 20,000 downloads. So, you know, uh, I'm just curious. Are you thinking of going into the political part of this to try to make some some changes in policy or you don't know yet? I don't know yet. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I don't know. That's <laughs> that's my Very response. Good answer. My... Good answer. Well, you know you're going to say it. You never uh, know. <laughs> I do. It's school. It's so hard. I cannot stress that enough. Please, um, if if there's anything that anyone can take from this, it's like love your teachers because they love your kids more than you could ever realize. What would you tell a parent that they could do to help you? What would be a message to a parent? Um, <laughs> that's hard. Um, what's one thing. What's one thing you would tell a parent that you know you could just do this one thing that would help help you a lot as a teacher? I think maybe support us. I, um, I support I think, you, right. Just um, just support and and just believe in your kid. Believe that they are capable of certain behaviors that they are capable of you know 
doing good and whether that's academics or whether that's just being a better person that's just have some faith in us in them you know? well thank you chelsea and definitely i want to bring you on when you take your next position oh thanks <laughs> thanks for having me <laughs> i just you know and we'll have to bring you on talk a little bit about being a millennial i'm going to have to do a millennial forum that have moved to state four to practice stress mastery all the time. I have you, I have David, you know, uh, Pablo, he's a coach in our community. You know, I like to bring you guys in and like have a conversation what it's like. The stage four of development, you have to have all five life categories shifted and to shift all your life categories at your young age is reason that you can do what you're doing in the classroom. It absolutely is why you're able to create an experience expansive classroom and become an expansion teacher. So congratulations. You've done a great job, my my daughter. Not because you're my daughter, because you've done a great job. Thank you. And it's I will awesome. take credit for you. That's it for today's show. Our mission here is to create a shift in the planet. You can join us on this mission by like, share, and subscribe. Those links are right below the show. As always, until next time, stay inspired.